and gentlemen, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Jake. This is the Fireside Tattoo Podcast. We're going to change gears a little bit, take a break from what we've been doing over the last several weeks, uh, which is talking to Carson Hill about all types of tattoo gear and machine related stuff. And we're going to um, jump subjects. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, apprenticeships. We're also going to change guests. Did I mention that? Carson's not in this episode. Our guest today, Ryan, actually reached out to us a couple of months back and mentioned that he had been through a type of apprenticeship that he did not believe we had ever discussed on the show, which was intriguing to me because we have talked a lot about apprenticeships over the years. I'll be honest, when we first sat down to do this episode, I did not know what to expect. Um, Honestly, didn't even know if it was something that we would put out because we discussed a lot of sort of taboo things in tattooing like you know homemade machines tattooing with guitar strings um you know kind of teaching yourself to tattoo as a kid prison tattooing tattoo schools all kinds of stuff uh but um ryan was a very articulate and thoughtful guy and has had a lot of interesting tattoo experiences he started tattooing way back well before i did in the late 80s early 90s took a long break like so many people do Uh, raising kids, dealing with family stuff, and now is getting back into it uh, over uh, over the last couple of years. One reason I thought this was such an interesting episode is because over the years we've had so many people reach out who are in similar positions that Ryan found himself in, you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, where, you know, tattooing was really intriguing to them. They knew it was something they wanted to do, and it was just really difficult to find an in. And um, anyways, I don't want to go too far into it. I think you'll really enjoy the episode. I can't wait to hear some of your feedback uh, about it. I'm interested to hear what you guys think about uh, about Ryan's journey. Uh, what else? I'll go real quickly through sponsors. You, it's the best way to support us right now. Support us by supporting our sponsors. There are links in the video description below. If you're looking for a new tattoo machine, head on over to Numa Tattoos and get yourself a 10% discount with the code Fireside. Uh, if you need help with shop management and uh, the business side of tattooing, check out TSM Pro. You can get yourself a hefty discount through our affiliate link there. Or if you're looking to up your tattoo game, up your drawing game, uh, then Reinventing the Tattoo by Guy Aitchison uh, is a great online learning platform with tons and tons of things happening all the time in their virtual community. All of those things you can get discounts on with the code Fireside if you use the links in the video description below. That's it. Check out this video. I hope you enjoy it, and thanks again for supporting what we do. Just give me a little background on on your on yourself. Like, when did you start? I don't know. When did you start drawing? Uh, what's your drawing background before you got into tattooing? I know um, uh, I know a little bit about how you started tattooing, but whatever you're comfortable rolling through, just just kind of roll through. Give me the like bird's eye view on your. Uh, background. So I started. I probably I've, I've I've drawn my whole life, and I think that it's because uh, I have a learning disability. So at a young age, that was my outlet. Um, that and my mother is a graphite uh, portrait artist. So as a child, and, and her parents and my grandparents are um, are painters, um, oil painters. So in my house, my mother would have like a, a art table, you know, like for blueprint, a big art table, and she would normally work on a portrait. It would take her six, eight months. So all year, I would see her work on uh, pencil portraits for someone. Oh, and wow. in my Wait, in my she, mother's house, she would work for months on end on a single piece. So she was like really, like these were really it, ref, refined pieces. She worked like, full time too. So it, you okay. know you can only spend a, a couple hours a day or an hour a day, and then on the weekend. So that's with full time work. And then so that's why it would take so long. And she was real meticulous at it. And still to this day in her house, there's uh, portraits of the Beatles, Reba, Reba McIntyre, Garth Brooks, like. Um, I, I, I always remember her working on those pieces for a long time. Mm. And, uh, she always told me that, uh, I hadn't found my medium yet. Like hers was different than her dad's. And, um, I would draw uh, always, um, I was a quiet kid. So I spent a lot of time, a lot of time drawing. And so somewhere in my early teens, so I had already always drawn in my group of friends. Um, we we kind of got started getting in a little bit of trouble. Someone decided like that we needed to get a tattoo machine in my hands. 
because I was the artist. I was, I could draw, I could do, at that time I was doing freehand lettering. Um, you know, we didn't have font generators. So uh, anybody needed like freehand script. Uh, I, at that time, started doing a little bit of time in juvenile hall. So in juvenile hall, kids would uh, pay me, give, they'd give me their sandwiches to write letters to their girlfriend because of the, the way I could write script. So I would do a whole envelope um, with, with a pencil and uh, their whole letter for them. And they would give me commissary and they'd give me sandwiches. So that started like with my freehand lettering. So and, was this uh, because, I, uh, so they were giving, they were saying what they wanted to say. It was more about the way that you, it was more about your script and not about how you were wording the letters. It was about like how the right. letters looked. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. It was the, the way my letters looked and uh, they would give me a letter in their, uh, their horrible handwriting. And I would turn that into uh, like a beautiful piece hmm. uh, what, from the envelope to um, the letter itself, you know, in back shade, some um, roses with my own little stencil, you know, and uh, they would, they would pay me for it. So in and out of juvenile hall a lot, um, my friends, they were like, man, we need to get Ryan a tattoo machine. And somebody's dad was in prison. So we got on the phone with him in prison and uh, we're like, how do you, how do you make a tattoo machine? And he, and he was like, you guys are, it's super easy. All you do is, you know, A, B, and C. So we took that small uh, bit of information and I, I remember going to the local mu music store and I walked in and, and I told him I needed a, I forget the name of the string, like an E string or it's the one closest to your, I didn't know it was, the highest. I didn't know the letter, the, the highest one to your body if you're right handed and the, uh, the arms in your left hand. Yeah. And the guy looked at me like, you only want one string? And I was like, yep. And I thought, should I run? I'm not going to get in trouble for this. And he was like, it was like $3. And I thought, well, all right. So we, we kind of made a, a machine and we had heard about making your own pigment. So we tried that and I did a couple of tattoos. And then, um, do you remember how, like what, what type of motor you use for the machine or what, what you use for pigments? So my, my first uh, machine was a craftsman cordless drill motor. And I mean, that thing was like, it was big. And uh, I used a, a plastic gear and a pin off that gear and a big, a big pin that I'd hollowed, hollowed out the ink and then ran my guitar string down it. It was sounded pretty crazy because it was so uh, such a big motor. And but still, uh, my friends were getting tattoos. I well, I didn't start tattooing them a lot. I tried on myself first. So before I was, I told anybody, you guys got to wait. So I'm tattooing my legs, um, understanding how, um, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and then once I got comfortable enough, somebody was like, I want my girlfriend's name. <laughs> so of course, then, then, yeah, then, then became a lot of that. So right about at that time, my mother, uh, had a boyfriend. This became my first tattoo mentor. So my mother's boyfriend was in um, was in Soledad State Prison in California, and he'd been in for 15 years. And he was a prison tattoo artist, meaning he was designated to tattoo by his group of individuals. He was that's what he did for them, and uh, he was good. He was really good. And when he got out, he he was like, "Let me, let me see what you're doing. Let me see what you're working with." And I showed him and he was like, okay, scratch all that. We're, we're going we're gonna to start from scratch and I'm going to show you how to do this. So he taught me how to make a pattern, how to, you know, we started off with carbon paper and we did hand stencils. Um, he explained to me about uh, the different guitar strings and the different gauges of those wires, which now translate to me into like from a 12 gauge, 10, eight and six, I didn't know that then though. I, all I knew was if I used a certain guitar string, it was more tout and larger. And we had other strings to use that were small or had a smaller core. So he was definitely into uh, like when we file our guitar strings down, like a shorter taper or a longer tape. 
and what effect that gave me tattooing. And uh, he explained to me about sanitation because I think a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think prison tattoos are dirty, but you'd be surprised at how clean they are. Those guys uh, have high level disinfectants. They get gloves. Um, they're not using normally the same guitar strip. Like it's, you bring your own and mm -hmm. it's not the cleanest environment, but it's definitely not as dirty as some people think. And I'm sure it's dirty some places. Like I've seen some crazy stuff in the Philippines, like, uh, but in the p individuals I know, it was a pretty clean process. And he was very like, um, you need to understand about hepatitis. You need to understand about HIV, AIDS. What year was this? That you that you met him and started this process. I'm gonna say about. so. I started tattooing in about 1992. Okay. And then he probably got out of prison in about 93, 94. And in, and and that's when um, he started to mentor me, and uh, he tattooed me, which at first he wouldn't, and uh, but he finally did, and I really. I uh, got to see how, how you get certain effects, which I didn't understand at that time, like how you get a really good stipple shading and how you, you know, how you get thicker lines, like how, how you go about certain things. Cause I didn't know. And uh, he was an amazing artist. And I think what I enjoyed most about watching him was he was a collage artist. So he can not only use a pattern, he can grab lines and turn it into different things and it was I used to sit as a kid and look at his tattoos and just be amazed at like how one line turns into an eyeball turns in to a tooth on something just it was amazing and I was yeah I was uh so he, he did a, it kind of that west what we would consider kind of that west coast style where things kind of morph where it might be kind of cloudy stuff that morphs into skulls that morphs into flowers that morphs into like stylistically what was he doing mostly black and gray was, I assume or no he was it was all black and gray yeah. He's an old school prison tattoo artist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think right now, if I was to describe it, I would call it Chicano art because uh, like car, car, cartoon definitely took, had that style. It was very similar to that. Women, skulls, roses, lettering, um, Vikings, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So was he using a traditional machine or did, whenever he started teaching you, was he teaching you with a, with a rotary or a coil machine, basically? What, whenever he said, scrap all that and let's start fresh, what, what did he put in your he hands? Said, he, so he said, scrap all that, we're going to start over. Because what I had built was, he was like, that's, that's not going to work. So he, he told me, go get a, go get a Walkman. You're going to take the motor out of the Walkman. You're going you're gonna to get the, either the pancake motor or the Jolly Rancher motor out of it. Those are the two shapes. And uh, here's what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And then he showed me his and um, I set it up and I would use um, Radio Shack had like a, a plug for the wall that had different speeds. So I upgraded. He would use a couple of AA batteries in a wristband, what, like a battery pack. Hmm. Uh, so I decided to go to Radio Shack and buy an adjustable um converter thing and anyways it had speeds from two point something volts up so that's where i could adjust my speed but we he he helped mentor me i understood about uh, like making patterns getting patterns to stick getting patterns to stay um how are you doing what you know, were you using to, to 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 adhere patterns to skin we were using speed stick yeah. so we'd use carbon paper out of an old old school photocopy machine that stinky ditto ditto paper mm -hmm. uh, my aunt used to work for a school and they closed they, they went with copy machines so she had an old box of ditto paper and she was like ryan would you like it we're throwing it out and i was like yeah that's a fucking score hell yeah and i probably used that ditto paper for years and years and years you know different ones because there's like 100 sheets in it yeah and uh so we would hand stencil. I, I learned how to shade. And uh, so he ended but, up going back to prison. Yeah. But real quickly, before you, before you go further off of that ditto paper, um, uh, I know fairly well the, the family that owns Spirit, the biggest, probably the biggest monopoly in all of tattooing, Spirit Tattoo Paper. 
uh, same exact thing. They were um, a multi-generational, the grandfather who's, who's since died, uh, was just an office supply store in, in that kind of Wisconsin, like the Northeast kind of area. Uh, and um, they were kind of a, a fledgling supply store uh, as uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And um, actually one of the family members found a tattooer going through their garbage and getting scraps. And he was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, we use this for tattooing. And that's how Spirit became a multi-million dollar <laughs> tattoo company. That's because, crazy. Yeah, because Office Depot and Office Max and online stuff eventually completely put the their business out, except for they did produce their own um, uh, car ditto paper, basically. Uh, that was like the one thing they had going for them. So yeah, go, go ahead. Wow. Bit, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing because when I got a hold of it, it was it was an exclusive item. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you couldn't, where were you going to get a ditto paper from? Right. You're going to just pull up to a school and ask them. They're not going to give you ditto paper. Right. So if, you know, to, to get a box of a hundred, like I, I, in my mind thought I'm going to have to make this last my whole life because, because ditto machines are gone. Yeah. And uh, I, I definitely used it sparingly like it was gold. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so my mentor mm -hmm. uh, ends up, so before he went to prison, I think I got a hold of, uh, I was in an old tattoo magazine because uh, a lot of times we, we would, that's all there was. So we'd go to the store and get tattoo magazines, check out what was going on. I remember in the back of that tattoo magazine was advertisements. And there was an advertisement for Huck Spaulding or Spaulding and Rogers. And uh, someone told me, like, you, you can't get anything from them. Like, they don't sell anything to anyone. So I thought, obviously, at that time in my life, I wasn't a big follower of rules in the first place. So I thought, I'm going to try. I'll find out. And uh, I think I called them on the phone in New York. And uh, I'm young. And asked, I said I wanted to buy some ink. I think at that time it was Pelican Black. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to send it to me and they did COD. And I thought, this is amazing. Like, no way, they're gonna sell me some ink and send it COD. So I was super excited. And it was a big bottle. I wanna say it's more like eight, 10 ounces. It was yeah, a big those, one. Those are big bottles. I hate yeah, it because when you tried to pour the ink, uh, it shot so far uh, over, you had to like hold it six inches behind the cap and hope that you okay. hit the cap. And I, I hated, I mean, I didn't dislike the ink, but I hated the bottle because of how it's. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. And it, it, so it came and I remember uh, it, it was a big deal because at the time I was using Indian ink from the art store, mm -hmm. like a small art store called Aaron brothers had Indian ink and that's what I was using. So I was like, wow, I'm going to get some real, some real ink. So when that Pelican black landed at my house and I paid for it, Huck's or Spalding and Rogers gave me this like inch and a half uh, like catalog yeah. and it was better than any Sears catalog I'd ever seen in my life better than any JC Penny Christmas catalog that thing was full of everything from A to Z and it had a whole bunch of flash in it mm -hmm. and uh, I probably everyone in my area probably photocopied flash out of that Spalding and Rogers catalog and and either used it or used it as the basis of, of what to draw from or ideas for years and uh so i started off with the pelican black and then i noticed in the they had uh, starter kits they had you know they had autoclaves uh there was uh, all kinds of stuff but i didn't think that they would sell it to me mm -hmm. about 1999 98 99 i started working more and making more money. I think I got my first tax return and I thought this is incredible. Like I'm going to become a professional tattoo artist. Here's how I'll start. I'm going to get rid of my uh, guitar string machine. Uh, and I'm going to get a couple real machines. And I spent, and it was an ungodly amount of money at that time for, I mean, the power box was probably a foot and a half long, this hammer finished, gray thing with the big huge dial i got a a, a liner and a, a shader the whole starter kit it's a, i still have it right here so this is the liner it's the only one that survived this is my spalding uh, and rogers puma 
yeah. from 1998, 99. Yeah, yeah. So they sent it to me and it was the full setup. It came with, uh, a, you know, anything from a razor to a, I'm an official tattoo artist, like a uh, thing you put behind glass. And uh, that day, I, I, I really hadn't done any color work and it came with some color. So I went in my bathroom and tattooed my thigh. And uh, I was sold. I thought, holy, holy shit. Like, what a game changer compared to a single needle. Like, I was working with a single needle, and I got very good with a single needle. What were you doing with a single needle? Just, just lettering, just line work and sculpting it up? Or were you trying to do fully rendered tattoos with a single needle? Fully rendered tattoos with a single needle. You'll, you would be so surprised at what, what a prison tattoo artist can yeah, do yeah. with just a single needle. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's tedious, mind you. Once you get a, a good coil machine in your hand with some different needle configurations, you definitely go, man, I wasted so much time with the single needle. But it's an art. It's, a, it's an art that I learned to respect now as, as a tattoo artist. Like, uh, I always still keep a single needle cartridge in my arsenal for certain situations. And a lot, a lot of artists are comfortable with single needles, but that's where I started. And certain effects I can get best with, with that. And uh, uh, man, I'll, I'll say, um, I when I started, my, my apprenticeship wasn't the best. It wasn't, it wasn't like yours, but it was, it was, it was a traditional apprenticeship. But, but I, I, my mentor was not very skilled, and I found that three liners were the only thing that I could leave a permanent mark in the skin with. I struggled with mags. And I, several of my first tattoos, I can remember specifically on a shoulder blade, a sun and moon, you know, the traditional kind of sun with the moon, half moon thing, um, doing all of the oranges and yellows, scumbling a three liner. And I, I know no photos uh, sur survived of it, but surprisingly, it wasn't good. It was terrible, but I, I did it on someone that I knew well at that time. And I knew, I saw that tattoo probably for three to five years after it healed. And there was yellow and orange still in the skin with a three liner filling with little circles. I mean, it wasn't great, but it was in there better than what I could have done with a mag at that point in time, to, to your point. Yeah. yeah. With the with single needle, uh, you do a lot of circles, <laughs> yeah. a lot of whip shading, uh, a, lot, a lot of circles. If you need a bold line, then you got to lay your line and then sit there and go drop one side of your line and circle it to get it bolder. And that's not a very bold line. So when you're doing... Uh, like, I, I guess your worst nightmare with the single needle is tribal. Like that would be your worst, worst yeah, nightmare. Yeah. But I've seen huge dark pieces with the single needle. It just, it's tedious. Like I got, now I'm spoiled. Like, uh, I'm super spoiled now, but I, I never forget where I come from. Like, I know that it's like first world problems. Oh, uh, I, I don't have the configuration that the particular cartridge that I want right now. Like I used to only have one and I dealt with it. I did perform miracles with one needle, not, I didn't need two machines, three machines. I didn't need all these variety of stuff, but now that I have it, you know, you get, you get spoiled, but yeah. Um, yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's hit that timeline just a little bit, just to clarify. So, so you're, you're starting in 91, 92 on your own. You, you meet this mentor that your mom started dating and he starts helping you around 94, 93, 94, but you're still using basically homemade like prison style machines at that point. When are you making the transition to the Spalding and Roger stuff? So on my Instagram, I, put, I found the, uh, one of the supplemental booklets that I got. So my son was born in 1998. So it was right after he was born. So I'm gonna say 98 or 99. Um, Did did you tattoo regularly from 94 to 98? I, I assume you were working I did. on jobs and just tattooing yeah. for fun or whatever. I, I did. I was known in my, in my neighborhood as Tattoo Ryan, everyone. Um, so in that, in that time in, in my town in Sacramento, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of tattoo shops in Sacramento and, but a lot of tattoo shops won't do certain things back then, you know, old school tattoo artists weren't doing, um, they, they're not going to do your girlfriend's name. Maybe um, they weren't going to do any, any, any gang related things, no necks, no faces, um, that kind of stuff. It was just no. So as a kid, 
everyone would say, Ryan, I want my girl, whatever it was. It didn't matter to me. I, I didn't care. I'll tattoo the flying wiener on your face. Like I, it didn't matter. It was art to me. And uh, I didn't do it for the money. I did it for the artistry. Like most people knew me from being a very giving person. And we, we couldn't afford, honestly, we couldn't afford hundred dollars an hour in a tattoo shop wasn't happening, but we had big hopes and dreams of being sleeved, you know, everything, but it wasn't possible. So as a kid, my goal was to reach those individuals and get them the art on their body at a, at an affordable price. At, at my young age, I didn't tattoo for a lot of money. Like I, I did a whole back piece on, on a, on a friend of mine, probably for a bottle of whiskey and a pack of Newports. And it was just the notoriety. It was, it was for me to be able to say and other people to say, um, man, Ryan did this. Like my homie Ryan did this for, for a bottle of whiskey and a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And, but the, it's quite ironic that that's what soured my tattooing. Cause for years and then year, years and years of that, then at some point you, you get, so you get very good. I, I mean, I had, now I had coil machines and I'm not being paid and people expect to be able to come over and just get free tattoos. And that became difficult. Part of my, uh, my coming up in the tattoo game yeah. was, uh, was people expecting, you know, but I set that standard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a super common problem. Uh, it's a problem at every transitional level in tattooing i think it's a problem whenever you're starting the tattoo and you're giving away tattoos just for the experience um uh, and you make the transition to charging a minimum rate and then when you become uh you know good enough to have a, maybe a uh a, a minimum price that isn't the hourly minimum when you go from the 30 dollar or 50 dollar minimum to the 250 dollar minimum uh, you know, that happens again when you start to move to the day rate or you move to the whatever it is, you find those things happening, I think, over and over. Uh, and I think the longer you spend probably at one, in one of those places, like if you spent five years tattooing and they said, oh, Ryan will do it for a bottle of whiskey. Uh, it makes it that much. <laughs> yeah. It makes it that much more difficult, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, so so um, I, I didn't mention it early on, but the whole reason that we're having this discussion is that you have reached out um, through social media and said that there was a, a an avenue of apprenticeship or, or that, that we had never discussed. And, and whenever we jumped on the phone, you know, we, we talked about this part of it, but then somehow you made this transition from, you're, you're a tattooer that's been working for 20 some odd years, move to Oregon and make the decision to go to tattoo school. I'm curious why and and what that experience has been like. So I think what it, where it started was, was uh, where I'm from. So in Sacramento and in California in general, if you want to be a tattooist, um, really, you don't have to do anything. You, you can start a shop today, get a business license. Um, you can get inspected for your safety and sanitations, probably a bloodborne pathogen, CPR, and, um, and you're good. But they go with the classic apprenticeship. So that same class, and I've been in several shops in Sacramento and got tattooed myself. I tested those waters. I tested those waters with those individuals. But for me personally, I didn't, just didn't vibe with them very well. Uh, part of it is because I've been institutionalized some. So the old school tattoo artist that wants me to sweep your floor and mop for a couple of years before you'll let me tattoo, um, I, I, I don't get down like that. Like you're, I, I'm, I don't learn well or work well with individuals that are going to put me under their thumb. And uh, I'm not going to be somebody shop bitch for a couple of years in the hopes that you're going to one day teach me. But that don't pay my bills and that don't feed my children. And I'm not a kid looking for a career. Like I already had kids. I already had to work a nine to five job. I'm already paying rent. So where, where do I have time? And they weren't willing to work with most people like, oh, you've already tattooed before? No, no, I don't want to. I don't I want to work with someone who's who's never touched skin before. The unfortunate part about that attitude is and, and the market today 
is you're you're forgetting about an entire group of individuals that already have that already could be skilled tattooists that just need honing and you're refusing to train them or work with them because they've already tattooed some of the most amazing tattooists i've ever seen have been in prison their their unfortunate downfall is they they can't shake that um that lifestyle to become productive members of society and then own the business and be a legitimate tattooist mm -hmm. for me i moved I moved to Oregon because uh, about 08, the economy took a crap. Um, I got a DUI and I, the type of work I did, I, I couldn't drive anymore. So I tried Oregon. It was a better, better fit to raise children uh, than Sacramento. Sacramento is uh, not the greatest place on earth to raise children. So I tried Oregon. So when I got to Oregon, I heard about um, someone told me, you can't just tattoo here. You have to go to school. And I thought, I've never even heard of a tattoo school before. What do you mean a tattoo school? And uh, I, I looked into it and I thought, man, I'm never going to be able to afford something like that. Like, how do people become tattoo artists here? So um, by some miracle, I, I started shopping. I started looking at um, tattoo schools or it's not always a school here. Um, a lot of people in the country think that uh, Oregon has a bunch of tattoo schools. I think school in the traditional sense, like you and I think of it, there's not very many of those here. Um, what it is normally is if you're an artist already, you can get a permit from the state. But to get that permit to teach, you have to turn in a syllabus. Um, you have to turn in your curriculum to higher education in the state, like, and you have to pay them a yearly permitted fee to teach. So there's a couple that are just like, it'd be like, like Guy Atchison, you go to his shop and he's licensed. So that's how you do an apprenticeship program in Oregon. You go to school because you can't do an apprenticeship in Oregon and become a licensed tattoo artist if they're not uh, a licensed educator. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I, I messaged, I have a friend that works at one of the schools in Salem. It's called uh, hot rod Betty's. So I reached out to him. He's a tattoo artist there. And I was like, Hey, uh, how does this work? And he was like, Ryan, uh, basically you're going to have to be here from 11 to four every day. And I thought to myself, man, I can't do that. Like I work, like I can't stop what I'm doing to go and pay you to go to a tattoo school. I shopped around, I reached out um, and someone finally reached back. So I, I'd been sending messages on Facebook to the tattoo shops that I found as registered schools in Oregon. And I got a, a, a message really quick back from uh, a lady named Pam Neighbors. I had seen that there was a tattoo school near me. And I just, but when I looked at first, it didn't, it looked like more permanent makeup. I'm the type of individual, I, I don't care. Like I, I, I've read the regulations. So I kind of understand that there is, it's the same license and I already know how to tattoo. I learn every day anyway. It's like, I never stopped growing. I never stopped learning. So I reached out and just, I asked her, would you be willing to work with me? And she said, uh, we have just started a hybrid school um, in Oregon. She owns a school in Washington also. So I can work with your work schedule. We do online classes. It's all like almost like via Google meets or zoom. Um, you're going to have to do uh, our, you know, so many hours of education. She broke it all down to me and my wife and I talked and I could fit it into my schedule. So my wife was like, why don't, why don't you, why don't you do it? Why don't you try and I, I took a leap of faith and signed up for, for tattoo school. And my other buddies who wanted to do this, like they were like, why, why, why don't you go to this other one? Like, why don't you go to Hot Rod Betty's? And I don't know why, but uh, the fit at Trillium and with Pam was, was perfect for me. Uh, it wasn't 
an old biker style tattoo shop that was going to be somebody that wants me to sweep the floor. It was, uh, I don't, me personally, I, I'm very receptive to, uh, motherly figures. Like I, I, and I have a lot of strong women in my family. So she was very uh, pleasant and very understanding. And what, what she said to me is I want to see uh, what you're, what you've been doing and where you're at. You can come. I came and toured the school and she said, I need to see your portfolio. And I thought, oh, well, here's where your normal uh, apprenticeship program goes south. When she goes, uh, you know, no, uh, that's not what I'm looking to, a person I'm looking to deal with. So I, I, I showed it to her and I was honest about how I got here, what I've been doing my whole life. And what she said to me was, oh, oh, we, we definitely, we need to get you licensed. We need to get you above board. Um, and I, I thought, wow, how, you know, how nice someone's going to give me a chance. So I don't know how long ago this was. I started school and, uh, I in, took the leap. in the last year or two years or what, how, how long how in long this that, last year, in the last year, how long is yeah. the, how long is the program as a whole, or is there a set length of time? There is not a set length of time. I think you could, you could go through it quicker than others. Some go through it quicker than others. Um, you can stay for six, eight, nine, ten months a year, or if if you wanted to. And uh, like for me, I'm enjoying it so much that I'm gonna probably stay. And it's it turns into more like an apprenticeship. I'm gonna go stay, help tattoo um, every other weekend, and and help them out because that's how that that particular school is structured differently than the others. There's like my class is four students. That's all they deal with. So there's four of us, two are body artists, one, both of us body artists have uh, previous experience. One was a tattoo artist in Reno, and, and then there's myself from Sacramento. The other two ladies are uh, permanent makeup artists. So in Oregon, I think that a lot of tattooists, when they look at the numbers, and I've heard this conversation like, the, the market's getting flooded with tattoo artists. But they're not realizing, like in Oregon, um, if you want to do eyebrows, you have to get the same license that I have. It's, a, it's the same license. And there's a lot of permanent makeup artists that have to go through the same school. So those numbers, like in my class, it's half of us. And the next class, it's all permanent makeup. There's no body artists in the next um, class. Yeah. What, give me just a kind of a, a, a snapshot of what the curriculum looks like. How much of it, if any, is, is drawing focused? How much of it is, is, um, is technique? And how much of it is stuff like uh, um, bloodborne pathogens and what you would go through with a, in a traditional apprenticeship with your health department? Um, it's, all, it's all the above. So when I first came in, I didn't think it was going to be this uh, intense or complicated. It was not what I expected. I'll tell you that. Like, so we do work on, we may have a project. We have 210 hours of um, theory we have to go over. So we'll start on laws and rules. Um, we go over safety and sanitation, but out of nowhere and unbeknownst to me, did I get like, I have projects, like college projects. I had to write four papers, pick three diseases and disorders, and then one medication that affect tattooing and, and write a paper on it. So last thing I thought when I was going to tattoo school was that I was going to have to write a paper. Um, but we, we have assignments like that a lot. Um, we have cover up assignments. She will uh, print out uh, an, an ugly tattoo. And then in, in the middle of class, just say, I want you right now, you guys all have to uh, come up with a cover up for this and use your colored pencils and, or whatever and come up with a solid design. And you're, so we're graded on that. We're graded on papers, on diseases and disorders. We're graded on cover ups. Uh, she'll say, I want you, my homework tonight might be uh, freehand lettering. I want you to do a freehand lettering piece and then turn it in. And I want to see it. And so we're graded on 
roses, lettering, cover-ups. We get tested. Like, out of nowhere, there'll be a pop quiz on, on, on a lot of different things. Um, there's extra credit projects like uh, non-porous materials. Like, if I, I was think I'm probably going to do an extra credit assignment on non-porous materials um, and set it helps other artists with what they should get for their shops to stay legal, to be legal. And the differences in, you know, different flooring materials and, 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 and what will pass with the state. So uh, I'll be doing a five page paper on, I think I've picked the history of the tattoo machine um, mm. before, before I'm done. Mm. I've, I've kind of put that off because it's so such a big piece. Yeah. But we do fake skin, um, you know, synthetic skin work, um, different methods, different shading methods. We do like needle configuration, like needle theory. We spend a whole, I couldn't tell you how long on, on needle theory and showing us. And um, not only we go over cartridges, but we also go over bars we have color theory. Color theory isn't uh, one of the more interesting ones for me because I, I didn't do a lot of color work. And uh, Pam is because of the cosmetic makeup industry. Like she she knows some crazy stuff about understanding uh, color and 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 how it ages and different colors like the color wheel and how to put things next to each other that pop better than and not get so muddy. Uh, we also have 50 practical tattoos that have to be turned over to the state. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm in my tattooing phase. Um, I'm 33 tattoos in on my 50, but I, I'm sure I'll continue to tattoo after the 50, but that's the state requires me to turn over to them. What, what are they, who is looking at that, if you know, who is looking at that at, at the state level and what are they looking for? Like artistry or just like, because they, surely they don't care the high, how high of a level your, your skill is that they're more concerned with, um, uh, I would assume they're more concerned with you making people sick, right? <laughs> or, or causing permanent damage. I would say, my, yeah, my opinion on, on, on how the state's involved is they are more concerned with safety, sanitation, and laws and regulations. They are also a part of your test is uh, machines. Um, color theory is uh, skin disorders. Like this, the test is broken down. The state test it's hundred questions in different segments. So if you're strong in uh, diseases and disorders, but you don't know shit about a coil machine, you won't pass the test. Um, they, I think they're looking for that you, that you're tattooing. Like yeah. I, I don't, I don't have that job, so I don't really know if they've ever had a concern like about one that they, they got sent to them, but, um, I'm sure that, you know, if you had some blown out horrible tattoo, that I, I could only yeah. imagine, I would, I wouldn't want a phone call from the state, uh, saying one of my tattoos was not accepted. But um, I, I'm sure that something like that could could happen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you know. You, I mean, with your background, I'm sure you have a good idea of how the bulk of like old school tattooers or just tattooers in general feel about the idea of tattoo schools or state and government kind of in, uh, involvement and in, you know in tattooing, which they've been involved in, in different levels in different states. You know, whether it's a you know, my state, an artist has to be licensed and a shop has to be licensed. In, in Texas, for example, a, an artist doesn't have to have a license, but a shop does have to have, to have a license. But um, I, I wonder what you're, having been through, having the unique experience of having been through a somewhat a tr traditional apprenticeship, although not in a shop environment, but a one-on-one -on -one type of mentor relationship, which most tattooers would say is ideal. And, and, and then a, um, it, it would say is ideal in a, in a good scenario. There are plenty of apprentice factories out there, you know, with the uh, tattoo shops that, that are that are hiring two or three or four apprentices at once and really aren't providing any oversight. But in an ideal scenario, most tattooers believe that an apprenticeship is the best method and these tattoo schools uh, are just flooding the market with tattooers. You address that a little bit with the 
a certain percentage of them are in the cosmetic side and not in the uh, in the artistic side. But um, what? What's your opinion? So I guess I got multiple questions there. What's your opinion on kind of the government involvement at that level, what you're dealing with in Oregon of tattooing? And then also uh, having had both of those experience of a private mentor and also a tattoo school. So I think my, my opinion on um, of the tattoo schools and, and how it works, Oregon is strict. I think Oregon is the strictest state in the United States and the way they have it structured. Do I care for having all those government entities involved? No, but so if you are a classic apprenticeship program I, in another state, you have an apprentice work under a tattooist, you have, what if that tattooist has some bad habits? What if he's not that, what if he doesn't do things the way, you know, you would hope he does when no one's looked like, what is that person handing down to that other person? And if no one checks, you, you, you can go generation to generation and it's like too many cooks in the kitchen. So now at what point do you have crap teaching crap? That's not the, every scenario. There's amazing artists that teach very good apprentice. Somewhere, somehow, someone is teaching someone maybe not the best way, but it may be their way. And that's what an apprenticeship program traditionally is you're learning their way their opinions you know the way they do things what i've learned is there's so many different ways to do things the, the, the moment you think you can only pull a line this way is the moment you're 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 dead you're 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 going to die out so in 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 school and having government agencies involved like they go through higher education so uh, it's not one, like my, my mentor or my instructor, it's not her way. She's her, her curriculum and her education process is taken from the best in the world. And, and that's, what's taught to us. It's not the way she does it necessarily. Like it may not be how she shapes, but she can give you her experience on how, it, but you're, you're getting, you're drawing from the best of the best in, in the, in the world. And uh, you have to be held accountable to that. I didn't think I was going to like this, like this tattoo school thing. But what I found was like, I've learned so much and I have to abide by so many standards. And as an example, um, last week, I got my tattoo insurance for my building and for as a tattooist. So out of nowhere, the insurance company asked me a bunch of questions like, uh, my glove procedure. Um, do I use an autoclave? Uh, do I have follow-up? And, and if I wouldn't have been an education, educated tattooist, I just, I would have bombed. Like there's no way I would have on the fly sent that email about my, my glove procedure, my sterilization techniques and, and, and how I was going to do what I do. And it got accepted. So with regulations, there are some headaches. I, I, I get it. Some people are just that way. They don't want any entity involved. You know, they want to live off the grid and they want to do things their way. You know, I get it. If, if it becomes overbearing. In Oregon, you have to have a license. You have to go to school. So if they have a set curriculum, at least we know like, Everybody knows um, how to stay clean and how to stay legal. At a classic apprenticeship program, uh, if, if your artist is not the best at laws and regulations, and then you go off and start your own shop and then you get in trouble, who do you have to blame? Like that artist? Oh, he, you know, a lot of guys have been in the game so long they don't remember all those details. You know, they don't, if, if, if you've been tattooing for 20 years and you haven't, do you remember that this particular thing is you should, you know, one little thing, you might lose a detail. It's very fresh in our minds because like I have to study this every day. Every day uh, I have an online portal uh, that I'm looking at and going over skin. 
there's a continuing education aspect as well, right? Once you're licensed, you have to complete hours like a lot of other professionals have to, don't you, in, in Oregon? Yeah, we, we have to have uh, 10 continued education hours a year. So after you get your license, um, which you renew annually, which it's pretty simple, you pay your uh, license fee, uh, turn in your bloodborne pathogen and your CPR, and then you turn in your continued education, and then you, your license gets renewed. Yeah. So your continued education hours can be different things. Um, conventions that like you may have a seminar at uh, the Portland convention uh, that's coming up May 1st. If I attend that, um, I can get continued education hours for that. Hmm. If I go take a class on, I've heard of guys taking like a Japanese finger waves uh, class. If you go do that, you get continued education hours. Um, clouds, you can do whatever it is. You, I, uh, that's how you get your continued education. I, I, I love that aspect of it, personally. I, I think that it's funny. I, I, I interview a lot of, I don't want to say up and coming tattooers because they're stellar, but they've been tattooing for 10 years or less. And anytime that they see or hear that I've been tattooing for 25 years, more times than not, they're like, oh, I'm surprised that you're any good. Like, I don't ever meet people that have been tattooing for 25 years that are any good. And, and I've heard many, uh, plenty of new tattooers say that. They just believe if you started tattooing in the 90s, you're probably not very good. And so I started paying attention to old tattooers. I'm like, you know, they're right. They're not good in the way that these new guys are good. Because we, a lot of us ended up kind of stuck in what we did before the online age, before the social media age. We didn't catch up with a lot of the way that, they, that people are uh, the way that they're using, I don't know, any number of tricks and techniques these days, you know, whether it's compositional, whether it's like creating a lot of atmospheric, atmospheric space or, or using really muted tones versus really strong tones or all kinds of tricks that new tattooers are using that a lot of people that have been working in the mid 90s didn't, we weren't, they, they didn't exist back then. And so I love the idea of the continuing education aspect. And I was first introduced to it, um, man, I don't know, it's gotta be five or six years ago now that I, I went to Portland with a tattoo supplier uh, to teach a continuing education class. They brought me in uh, just to do a quick little like hour long thing and they had a full day uh, that they were providing and then all these tattooers came in, probably 20, 25 tattooers. And I was surprised to see all the tattooers coming to a continuing education thing. And, uh, and as I talked to them, I realized none of them wanted to be there. They were there because they needed the hours and they waited until the last minute to get the hours or whatever it was. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't even know that this was required. And I'm talking to people and then I do my talk. And then, and by the end of it, everyone had a blast. I mean, like everyone hung out later. No one left as soon as it was over. Everyone hung out. There was like food and drinks and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and for that period of time, I'm sure that it's, I'm sure we're not anymore, but for that period of time, uh, the supplier or the, 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 yeah, the supplier that brought me out uh, included Fireside Tattoo Network in their registration. So we were like a licensed uh, continuing education provider in Oregon for a year, I guess. So I don't know that we are anymore. Yeah. But I thought, it, but I loved it. And I don't know what, I, I know nothing about it outside of that. But I love the idea of it because it just gets you off your ass a little bit, gets you out of the tattoo chair. It gets you like engaged with other people and, 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 and listening to new ideas that probably someone like myself, if I weren't in the business of talking to the tattoo or someone like myself that just goes to my studio, and does my work every day, I would never, I would never be privy to. I would never learn anything about. I, I, I would you just, wouldn't. Yeah. So I, that part of it, absolutely, I think is beneficial. And I think it's something, I think continuing education is something that every state could benefit from. And I know that I'll get smashed on YouTube over this, but I believe that it's, uh, I believe it's true. Even if it's not mandatory, even just being able to have it. So I think that the problem with old school tattooists, let's say 80s, 90s uh, tattoo, tattooists, they did things one way, that w their way. They were set in their ways. Uh, it was like the old boys club. You know, you're not telling them anything. They're, they're, this is how they do it. So now I think something changed in the 2000s. I remember you know, going into tattoo shops, getting tattooed myself, you know, it was standard biker tattoo shop, flash art on the wall. Um, this, something happened in the 2000s. I don't know what it was, but I remember seeing new tattooists and thinking, oh, oh man, like, they, man, they're good. 
I'll, I can't do that. Like, wow. So with continued education, you have the opportunity to go learn something that you maybe are not the best at. So old school tattoo artists, they don't want to learn anything. They don't care. They, they have their lane. They, they've got their group. This is how they do things. And they're going to stay stuck. But that's that, that stay stuck attitude, um, as, as we learn in life with uh, the market and how things work, um, that's a dying breed. If you're not willing to learn, um, then, then you're so one dimensional. Now with tattooists, if, if you had the opportunity to, to take a class on gray, gray wash, then if you were doing a different style and you wanted to get better at it, why wouldn't you, uh, you know, if I wanted to get better at a uh, business, I would go to school, I'd take a business class. Right. Mm -hmm. So th there's a, there's a change in the attitude and the, the old boys club in tattooing, I believe is, is what's going away. It's, it's now, um, we talk shop, we work together. Um, it's not like my little area of expertise that I will never share. And, you know, I will never let my pretty go. It's more like, oh man, I saw your portrait work. How did you do, how did you do that? And then you're open to learning and someone says, you know what? I used a shader the whole time. No, no liners. And to an old school tattoo artist, you're like, what, what, what do you mean? No liners. You have to be open to learn. And with the continued education, like I'm excited, like I could choose to learn something from someone who's amazing and spend the weekend and, and take that bit of knowledge with. Me. And um, I've dealt with some really cool new tattoo artists or even older ones that are willing. The other individuals that are in school with me, they are, they're sponges, like, they're willing to learn even if they have tattooed before. And I think that that attitude is what is the direction that we're going in tattooing. It's feeding off each other. It's working together and, uh, and, and learning from each other. How do you do, how are you doing what you're doing yeah. and, and how are you getting that? Yeah. I, 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 I it's really interesting. I, I, and I love hearing you, hearing you say all that because typically and not not to be stereotypical but a lot of times when people come from a background like yours where you were taught by a prison by someone that learned to tattoo in prison and you came up using homemade machines and stuff like that in my experience in 25 years of doing this that is the most closed-minded group of people in tattooing uh, that that's the old school mentality that's where i see those people coming from i knew a lot of those guys too everyone that my first shop dragon master in memphis tennessee 1995 96 was basically uh not all of them learned to tattoo in prison, but but enough of them did. And they came from that background and it was a very sabotage, like I'm going to stay on top, sabotage mind uh, oriented uh, kind of um, mindset where it was like, I, I literally watched someone one time sabotage their own apprentice by dragging needles, running the machine across the countertop before the apprentice started tattooing, only because the apprentice drew so much better than they did. And they were looking for a reason to get them out of the shop. And that, and, and in my experience, people that came from uh, uh, a background that was like um, a competitive, I mean, for, you know, just a competitive background, uh, they, they, um, they were the most closed-minded group. And, and to show how new this type of mindset, what we're talking about right now, to show how new that mindset is to me, um, if you look back, our first video that was actually like how to tattoo like not that we do a lot of how to tattoo we're more drawing focused i think but i did do one called three simple ways to build up line weight and i'm going to guess that was maybe 2014 on youtube you can look it up and see whatever it was but if you go back and there are probably two thousand comments on it or more now i have no idea but if you go back and look at those early comments i got smashed there was a comment on that that said you should kill yourself I mean, that's how bad people were that I was giving away tattoo information in 2014. <laughs> and so you fast forward seven years 
and, and, and see the conversation that you and I are having right now. It's just funny how that, how that transition has happened. And uh, uh, I, I don't have a point otherwise, I, uh, other than I, I believe I know why it's happened. I think we all realized there were people that have been tattooed in two or three years that were way better than us. And it was like, well, that shit ain't working anymore. We got to figure something new out. I can't pretend yeah, I'm that, better. It's that old, old boys club, I call it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. It's a group of individuals that wanted to hold, hold in this little box their skills and not share it. But what they didn't realize is prison tattoo artists have been smoking it for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. So they can't, they, they can't just say, oh, we don't want to share what we're doing. We don't want to teach anyone else. They already know how to tattoo. They, they're already putting out work. I, I know individuals that want to go to prison to get tattoos because of the artistry that's there. I, I don't know if you'll, if you'll know the answer to this or not, but, but in your mentor's experience, you spent time, or, or in yours, but uh, if you are the prison tattooer, if you're the dude that people are coming through and you have that kind of clout, are you, open my, are you willing to teach other people or are you holding it close to the vest? Um, from my experience, uh, the, the, whoever's tattooing, he's a busy man. Uh, he's a wealthy man in prison. Like, uh, the way it's structured, uh, you know, they, they're, they have money on their books. They have commissary. They're booking, uh, just like we would, they're booking appointments overnight and, and tattooing all night, like almost like a slumber party in your cell. Hmm. And, um, I think that those individuals would be willing to help someone else. Like, yeah. yeah, they're fine with showing you how to tattoo or, or teaching you how. Um, it's one of those, that, that group of individuals is not trying to, because they're going to move on. They're going to get out. So they're, or they're going to move facilities. So there's, they all want tattoos. So they need to have a bunch of people tattooing. It's, there is no shortage of tattoo artists in prison. It's more like, which, whose style do you like? So when one leaves, there, there's several others. And uh, depending on what style you like and what their price is. Like, I thought prison tattoos were cheap, but they're, they're not. Because there's guys that are, you know, really good that do very unique work that um, they yeah. are pretty fast, too. That's the, that's the thing. Like, you go to a, if I went to, you know, I'm getting six hours of work done, but you, you get some of those artists and they can, they can sleeve you out quickly. Yeah, I, that makes sense. I, I really wasn't thinking of it that way, that there's probably more work than any one person can handle. Uh, mm. uh, so why not, why not help out? And, and of course, you know, at some point you're going to get, some point you're going to get out of there hopefully. And, uh, and someone else has got to, <laughs> it's just got to be left behind to do the work. And what an interesting, uh, we're, we're over an hour in, so I'll try to shut it down here, but what, a, what an interesting kind of experience you've had that you had already kind of, obviously gone through an apprenticeship, spent a decade or so tattooing or more, and then, and then uh, realized that there was some benefit to, uh, to, continue, to continuing your, the education side of it. I think that's the one thing that people that have been tattooing for a long period of time still kind of struggle with is saying like, all right, I can, I can learn something from anyone. It doesn't matter how long that they've, how long they've been tattooing. You, you made a, there was a great example saying like, oh, well, you know, I don't use, I only use mags. Like that's why the eyelids look so soft. Like I don't outline anything. I, I just use shaders or anything and I sculpt and I build up. And, and that wasn't something that any of us had heard of. That wasn't a thing that you, you know, there was a very like, um, th there was a, a specific order of operations in tattooing for ever until just recently you know i and and then you see people that are that are like breaking the rules and you're like oh well what what are any of these rules then you know and uh, um uh, unfortunately i still I'm, I'm around enough people here locally uh that, that still are kind of stuck in in that old uh old mindset and i see exactly what i was talking about earlier with newer tattooers saying that old tattooers aren't any good i see the proof of that all the time in my own town uh, so man, good, good job to you to like, to, to step out and, and jump into a tattoo school, especially with, at, at, you know, as long as you've been doing it with the family and all that. Well, so if people want to 
people want to keep up uh, with, with what you're doing and keep up with your shop, where do they, where do they find you? So they can find me on Instagram or on Facebook at Grieving Inc. Tattoo. Um, I have a shop in uh, Amity, Oregon. Um, you can just find, you can find my work on Instagram. I have two professional pages, either the Facebook or, or Instagram. And, uh, you know, just reach out. I, I love, I love, I love to make connections. Um, I love to visit tattoo shops and, and talk shop and yeah. keep, keep growing. Like that's my whole point. Like I, I don't want to stop learning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll drop all that, uh, in the, in the show notes uh, below. I mean, I really appreciate you sharing your story. I'm glad you reached out. I, I uh, uh, I've, I've learned a lot. I really knew, I knew very little about, you know, kind of prison tattooing at all. And then I've only learned little bits about tattoo school. So I always feel like I grab another kind of new nugget about tattoo schools. Uh, each time I talk to someone that's either uh, running one or going through one or, 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 you know, has been through one in the past. And if there's one thing I'll say for sure that I'm for, uh, it's that continuing education uh, piece of it. I think that's super, super valuable. And anything that you can learn on the um, theory, that's what you go, yeah, like the theory side. That's something that most tattooers in traditional apprenticeships just don't get a whole lot of. So uh, I, uh, I, can't Im I can't imagine that there's a downside to that. Yeah, uh, there's, there, there's no disadvantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, man, thanks so much, Brian. Great to meet you. All right, man. So, uh, thank and, you. Uh, yeah, and thank you all for, uh, for uh, supporting Fireside Tattoo Network, and we'll, we'll catch you next time. Hey, thanks again for watching. Please be sure to like and comment and subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with all of the things that we are doing. Uh, if you would like to buy us a drink, please support us on Patreon. There's a button somewhere around here that allows you to do that. You can also visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter so you know where we're headed and what we're doing. And while you're there, please check out our merchandise page, buy yourself a fancy new Fireside t-shirt. Thank you for supporting the Fireside Tattoo Network and we'll see you on the next episode.